Uh, if I say the band Corn, some of you will be like, what? Uh, Cottage smoking, because he knows them. They're sort of like a, a metal, it, they're not, yeah, they're not death metal, they're sort of like a serious guitar band. They've been touring for quite a while, and uh, I heard recently, I don't know how long back it was, but I heard recently that uh, not so long ago, their lead singer resigned from the band. And the reason that he resigned from the band was because he'd become a Christian. And for him, the reason that you know, he's out singing all this stuff that's got very little to do with the glory of God and, and being a Christian, and he decided for him, the right decision was to pull out of that. But he decided more than that as well. What he decided was that, I'm going to resign from that band, it's a very public thing, he'd got celebrity, he'd got money, he'd got status, he'd, in many ways he'd got the world at his feet. He got prominence, he got notoriety, and he backs out of it and says, actually, I want to stand for Jesus. And that's a great thing to do in many ways, isn't it? To make a public stand and say, I am standing for Jesus. But he did more than that. Uh, the, Christ- the Christian press, they loved it. They were like, hooray, we've got a celebrity turning to Jesus. This will make such a big difference. It's just what we need, a celebrity. And he had big ideas himself, this singer. He wanted to write a new album that was really similar sort of style of music. He thought, right, if I write a new album with my style of music, I can tap into a whole generation or a whole group of youngsters who perhaps otherwise wouldn't hear the message. And perhaps he would do, perhaps he will do. It's going to be great. And as I reflect on that, I, I want to do two things. I want to celebrate it, and I want to sound the word, the word of warning. I want to celebrate it, that God's message is going to find a way to go forward. So this guy, is, he understands that that's what we're supposed to do as believers, carry the message of, of the gospel out, and that was his natural instinct to do it. Yeah, I want to sound a word of caution, which is, the Lord very rarely uses some sort of triumphal celebrity to do that with. Because the Lord's got a bigger agenda than that. And there's no one better to see that from than the Apostle Paul here in these verses we've been looking at. Because he is the ultimate celebrity of his day, isn't he? He represents celebrity, intellect, power and ambition. And he has got it. We're told in other parts of the Bible that he was progressing in Judaism way ahead of other people his similar age. He was the golden boy, the one who has been polished up shine to be the poster boy. He had got everything, and all he wanted to do was get rid of Jesus. Now, that's always the way, isn't it? You either love Jesus or you hate him. The only reason that more people in our country don't publicly hate Jesus is because they don't realise what his claim is. That he claims to be the Son of God with us with total authority over our lives. I think if people really did understand the claim of Jesus Christ, they would be a lot less polite in their rejection of him. Perhaps we would have a few more uh, bricks thrown at our window, I don't know. But Paul, sorry, Saul, was a man on a mission. His mission was to murder and stamp out Christian believers so that the name of Jesus went no further. Stop it being carried anywhere. And yet, as we heard last week, he was literally stopped in his tracks. The Damascus Road, boom, God stops him, lays his hand upon him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It was personal. It was Saul's intention to destroy Jesus, and clearly he didn't know the true and living God. Of course, God lays his hand on him, he's blind for the three days, he's led into Damascus, which is a great irony, isn't it? The one who was supposed to lead away these Christians in chains is himself led blindly into the city of Damascus. Ananias comes to him, we know the story, and Saul is commissioned. But look at what the Lord says he will do in this celebrity. Verse 15 and 16. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So in many ways it's a coup, isn't it? This superstar changes teams, but we're supposed to see who the real superstar here is. Saul needed to learn that too. His celebrity isn't going to help him in what he's called to do. And that's what we're going to learn today. God's chosen instrument is nothing more than an instrument. That word for instrument literally means vessel. It's 
sort of split something used for, for a purpose of carrying to it, it, it's great. Now this is God's chosen instrument, but he's nothing more than an instrument. God is the superstar, and it is God's light that must shine. Now this is really important for us, isn't it? It's very important for us. You see, it tells us that God is not sitting up in heaven hoping that certain people will get saved. Now that's a relief, isn't it? We do, don't we? If only that celebrity got converted to God, imagine what would happen. Or, we possibly put it a different way, don't we? Um, If only we had that giftedness in our church, then everything would be different. We can think like that, can't we? But he doesn't, or God doesn't sit sit in heaven and say, Oh, Saul, he's finally converted. Wow, this could be a big thing. I must manoeuvre him to make the most of this. No. God works on the most unlikely people. He worked on Saul, who was a Jewish guy who hated Gentiles, and he said, listen, Saul, you're going to become Paul, and you're going to go, not to Jewish people, who you're most trained to, not to necessarily learned people, you're going to go to those great, grubby, non-Jews who you've hated for so long. And you're not going to be the celebrity, you're not going to be the superstar. I am. He picks people you won't expect to get the job done. Now, isn't that a relief? For you and me. I don't think anybody in this room is who we would pick to get the job done here and speak. Is it? No. And yet God, in some sense, makes us his chosen instrument for here in speak. So we're just going to explore this very briefly under two simple headings. And those two simple headings are, are found in that commissioning statement in verses 15 and 16. Can you see it? Go, this is my man, uh, this, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before p- the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now he is something of a model of what God is going to do in a life. He is a unique model. Okay, this is the Apostle Paul who was called out to go to the nations. But there's a sense in which we can be a smaller version. I think that's what the Lord is, is getting at here, that this is personal, and this is something of a pattern for all the believers, all people who come to him. Two things. Carry my name, suffer for my name. Here we go, carry my name. Now here Paul, uh, Saul, if I keep getting that wrong, forgive me. It's Saul at the moment, he later becomes Paul, but if I could swap, forgive me, okay? He wastes no time, does he? Verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now that uh, that word for preach is a little bit like town criery. He's he's taking out a message to be responded to, to the people in the locality who hear. And what is the message? It's the first time we hear it in the book of Acts. That Jesus is the Son of God. So Saul was under no illusions now about who Jesus was. Verse 22 we find, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the, the Christ. It's Jesus' identity. He is the Son of God and his job, the rescuing king. There's no doubt about the change. It's all about Jesus. Now this is the history of the book of Acts. It's all about how Jesus' name gets carried out. Flip back, just very briefly, keep your finger in there, flip back to chapter 2. And you'll remember that in chapter 2, Peter is standing up after the resurrection and ascension and announcing what has happened in these days in the temple in Jerusalem. Turn, if you would, to uh, chapter 2, verse 21. For here, Peter quotes the Old Testament and the book of Joel, where Joel is speaking of what the Lord God will do amongst people Yahweh, the God of Israel, will do amongst people in the future. Look at verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, that is the God of Israel, the one true God, will be saved. Flick over to verse 35. When the people, sorry, verse uh, 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahweh, Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is God. Jesus is God and his name needs to be lifted up. Jesus is the saving God of Israel. So what are his people, what is Saul here to do? Ensure that the name and fame of Jesus, his eternity, his power, his massiveness is carried out. He's to carry out the name of Jesus to everybody. No wonder they were astonished back in Damascus, it tells us there, at his teaching. Here was Saul, who had lived for the sake of his own name. So we've heard he was progressing in Judaism, and he was doing something really, rather typical of a religious person. They were using the honouring of God as a way to make a name for themselves. There's no more perverse of sin, and it, let's be honest, it's a massive temptation to anybody who does anything in church. Pray for me in this. The idea that as I stand here, I'm supposed to be honouring and speaking the name of Jesus, and the temptation that I use this as a means of making myself get a name to. Terrible. Could you just catch that? Stick it back in before it falls out for us, please. Lovely. Push it up and then twist it up. Upwards, that's it. Good. Brilliant. Thank you. Well done. So here was Saul committing this terrible sin of using the, the whole purpose of honouring the name of the Lord as a, really a way to get himself, build himself up, but not now. So imagine the conversation that he has with jo, uh, sort of Joe Jew in the city of Damascus. And Joe Jew says something along these lines, uh, I like the idea of the God of the Old Testament. In fact, I've tried to follow his laws and be right with him all my life. Why? I don't need Jesus. Jesus has got nothing to do with it. And Paul skillfully takes up his Old Testament law, smiles, unravels it, says, let me show you something. Look at these things in the law and in the prophets, that speak of the fact we need a saviour. Let me show you how God himself promised to come and be with his people. Let me talk you through and show you that all of it, every last bit, is about getting us ready for Jesus. Oh, says the man. He scratches his head. Well, what about all that law keeping? What about all that rules? What was all that there, sitting in the Old Testament? Oh, good says Paul, Saul. He says, good, because my heart danced with the thought that God was holy and wonderful, but I used his law as a way of avoiding him. You see, what I would do is I would focus on my own achievements, my own righteousness, in order to try to be acceptable to God. I would try and save myself. So more and more I would labour and labour. That is why I was killing those Christians, because it got me ticks in God's good book. And as I was doing that, I was more and more pushing myself into pride and away from God. I was trying to fix the the gaping gulf between me and God by law-keeping. And all that righteousness, it just clung to me, and it was rubbish, pulling me away from the fact that what I needed was mercy. And then I was shown the righteousness of Jesus that he more than fulfills it, that he brings me near to God. So I would say that any righteousness that I got myself was rubbish because it was pulling me away. I don't present to God a perfect record. He presents me with a perfect record as I turn to Christ. So I even went as far as repenting of my good deeds my good deeds that were done with the motive of getting me right with God. I wonder today whether any of us here need to repent of our good deeds. See, we're in church, we're supposed to be talking about good deeds. No. But some of us need to repent of our good deeds that we use as a way of getting the thumbs up with the Lord. What do we do, really, that's motivated out of guilt, perhaps? or a desire to keep up appearances, as a desire to gain our own righteousness. And it could be a wonderfully good thing. And we need to say, Lord, forgive me for trying to use that good thing as a way of being right with you, when only Jesus can put me right with you. 
So can you imagine the result of Saul has these conversations, one person after another, after another, after another, and we're told what happens. He's got disciples there, so some are converted, and others say, outrageous, I want to present my own righteousness, and I will not recognise Jesus as the Lord. So they want to come and kill him. And we can see that there more than once, can't we? So make no mistake, look at the way Saul goes about doing this. It says he preached, he proved, he talked, he debated. He's trying to put, push people to a conclusion about Jesus. He's not being nicey-nicey, well take it or leave it. He's carrying out the name. He's taking it to them and saying, you're going to meet him one day or another. Please, meet him today as your saviour. Don't meet him as the judge. For one day you can't avoid it. Meet him as your saviour now, please. <laughs> so what are we con- to conclude? Are we supposed to do what Saul did? Well, we haven't got the scope. You see, if Saul was supposed to carry out the name of Jesus, then I'm guessing that he is something like a freight train. Huge and massive, going everywhere. I suppose you and me, we're like those pack horses. You know, with a little four legs, wandering along with a little bag here, a little bag here. We've got the same message. But we're not commissioned in the same way that the Apostle Paul is. But I'm guessing that today, if you've been chosen as an instrument, which you have if you're trusting Jesus, then there will be a desire in you to, in some way, carry out the name of Jesus. Whether it's in our words, whether it's in our our kindness to others, whether it's in the way we pray for people, whether it's in the way we try to bring people to hear of him, whatever that means is, we will be actively carrying, showing Jesus to everybody as best we can wherever we go. So if you're a growing believer, you will want to carry out his name. But second of all, if you're a growing believer, there's a sense in which, to some degree or another, there will be suffering for my name. That's the second point there. Now this is odd really, isn't it? Um, Shouldn't this be a case of, right, I'm God, I've called you Saul to go out to do my bidding amongst the nations, uh, With every other king you know, it's a case of when the king's going off to do a job, uh, he sends his people out ahead of them to clear the way. Make way for the king, because it's a nice, smooth arrival. Um, But that's not what happens here. In fact, I I watched that motorbike uh, documentary, you know, the the long way down and the long way round, you know, where uh, Hugh and McGregor and Charlie Borman, Borman, that's it, Borman, uh, they go either round the world or from top to the bottom of the world on their motorbikes, and what they've got is fixers. So they have people who are paid in each country to sort of fix everything. So if there's border crossings that need to be dealt with, or if there's visas that have to be arranged, or if there's you know, local customs that have to be negotiated, this fixer sorts it all out, so it's just a clear, all they need to do is concentrate on moving out. Wouldn't it make sense, Lord, if, um, if your people are going out, sent on your mission, they had a fixer to make it all nice and smooth and easy for them? But from the start here, it's very clear that there are going to be challenges. You see, he's on the king's business, but there's no limo, there's no retirement home, it's rather hot water and heartache. I will show you how much you must suffer for my name. Now, we don't like this, do we? I'm just quoting a minister I heard earlier this week. He said, we coach ourselves carefully on how to avoid complication, difficulty, and suffering. We almost believe it's our right to have a nice, easy, comfortable life. That's why God's created us, isn't it? So why does the Lord do this? Why is it that he says his star man, his celebrity, is going to have to suffer? And why is it that we're going to face hardships and difficulties as we go about his business? It's this. So much of God can't be learned in moments of triumph and success. They can only be learned, enjoyed, in times of trial and hurt. Let me say that again. So much of God, who he is, what he's like, how gracious, how near he is, can't be learned in moments of triumph and success. They can only be learned, enjoyed, in times of trial and and hurt. And many of you here are living testimonies of that, aren't you? 
Three times we're told here that they try to kill Saul. He has to escape in a basket. Later on in the New Testament, this is looked back on, and um, back in the old, uh, back in those times, the, the the chief soldier, the most decorated soldier after a battle, was the one who was the first over the wall. You know, they had these siege uh, siege cities where the Roman soldiers they would tell right, okay, the one who will get the most glory is the first one who is daring enough and bold enough and brave enough to be first one over the wall. And later on, at that point in the Second Corinthians, Paul boasts. Now, rather than that he was the first one who braved the wall to get into the city, he said, I was so rubbish, I had to escape in a basket at night, lowered by friends. You see, already, Saul who becomes Paul is learning the contradictory nature of ministry. God will fulfill his purpose, but he will not do it in a triumphalistic way. He shares his glory with no one. What else happens to Saul here? Well, he's rejected by the community. And you can understand why, can't you? Here is the guy who has killed some of their family members. Here is the guy who has been breathing out, we're told at the beginning of the chapter, murderous threats against them. And although three years have elapsed, by the time he comes down to Jerusalem, he's too hot to handle. They don't want to touch him. You can imagine their feeling, I'm sure they think of an equivalent, I thought of the three stag do's that I've attended from people here, whether it was Matty... Uh, Luke or John and if you're one of the stags that are stag do you know you're there with your mates but you just really